Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Thursdays with Friends, our online conversation on issues near and dear to FCNL's work. I'm Alex Franzen. I'll be your Zoom host this afternoon while our regular host, Wesley Pinkham, takes a well-deserved break. Um, it's been two weeks since the election, and this time around, we'd like to use this time to discuss some of the issues that we really want the 117th Congress to work on when they begin their work on January 3rd, 2021. Our host for today, as usual, is FCNL General Secretary Diane Randall, and her guest today will be Dr. Ebby Luvaga, Clerk of FCNL's Policy Committee, and Amelia Keegan, Director of FCNL's Domestic Policy Programs. So without further ado, here's Thursdays with Friends host Diane Randall and her guests. Thanks, Alex, and welcome as our tech host and supporter here. It's great to have you with us. Um, and welcome to everyone who has joined this call, this Thursdays with Friends call. Uh, I want to make sure, is everyone hearing OK? No? OK, hold on one minute. Sorry, I should have tested it. Are you hearing now? It's working? OK, sorry. Uh, just a little bit of technical changes here. Um, as Alex noted, so much has happened in the last two weeks. Um, we have a new president, um, which we weren't clear about two weeks ago when we first convened. FCNL has had a fabulous annual meeting that just concluded on Tuesday, our annual meeting and Quaker Public Policy Institute. And I know there are people who are on this call who joined with us. Um, that is a time when FCNL makes governance decisions, but it's also a time when we lobby. And we were thrilled to have over 200 virtual lobby visits with congressional offices on Capitol Hill. Very amazing. Uh, we were lobbying on the Justice and Policing Act, and you're gonna be hearing more about that in the, in the months ahead. But today, I wanna to turn our attention to um, our guests. I'm just, uh, you know Amelia Keegan, who's the, the uh, Legislative Director for our Domestic Policy, and I'm really honored to welcome Evi Vaga, who has served on our policy committee for a number of years, and is now stepping into the role of clerking the policy committee. So I'm gonna start uh, with Evi and just ask Evi if you could describe a little bit about the, what the policy committee does, because this is a committee that is so essential in determining what the legislative priorities for FCNL will be in the upcoming Congress. Uh, thank you, Diane, and uh, thank you, friends, for joining us today. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, this year for sure has been a very exciting year, like you said, and uh, the policy committee, we are actually, uh, we take responsibility, although we work with our friends across the country in trying to help discern and come up with the policies that uh, FCNL lobbyists in Washington are going to focus on for uh, lobbying purposes and also for grassroots uh, energy. So the process actually of setting uh, the priorities, particularly for this coming uh, Congress, it began in January, believe it or not, began in January of this year uh, with the policy committee on behalf of the general committee sending out a letter to meetings, churches and friends and groups asking them uh, for their worship and uh, just encouraging them to take part in this nation nationwide discernment around the issues that FCNL should be uh, focusing on for this uh, coming Congress. So uh, this is actually not really unique because from its inception, uh, the Friends Committee on National Legislation has really relied on meetings and churches to ground our work in the concerns of Friends. So our process of asking Friends to consider every two years, and we do this every two years for a uh, uh, each uh, coming uh, Congress, um, we, we look at which issues should be the focus of their lobbying organizations in, in, organization in Washington, D.C., and uh, connects our advocacy to uh, the testimonies and values of friends. And uh, the participation of meetings and churches across the country is essential to making the Quaker be and who 
We are, and particularly from the issues that we work on and the way we focus on building relationships and looking for that of God in everyone that we talk to. And in politics today, and you're right, I mean, we were, uh, we knew that elections were coming and, uh, and it was kind of a very testy time, but in politics today, the kind of approach that FCNL takes is very unique and it's very important and it's a very helpful and needed at this time. So, um, and just to kind of go back, and I don't know, Diane, if you want me to talk briefly about the exact process uh, that we went through starting in January, will that be very helpful? It would, but I want to say, uh, Abby, also just say a word about who is on the policy. Um, you are on the policy committee, and you happen to be an economist at Iowa State University and bring that kind of expertise. But the other expertise you bring is as a Quaker uh, at Ames meeting in Ames, Iowa. And so I think as you talk about the, the process, if you could just also um, kind of balance what's necessary in terms of um, the qualities we're looking for as we do discernment. Yes, uh, when we do uh, sit to discern, we consider a lot of things because we end up hearing from many Quakers of different walks and lives. And like you said, I'm a member of the Ames, Iowa Conservatives. So the way we may look at some of the issues that we may want to focus on will be probably a little bit different from some of the issues, some of our other friends and Quakers will want to focus on. So as an economist, some of the issues that came up had to do with the banking system. We had from some friends who are really interested in how we can revamp or ship the entire banking system. And we listen to that information and we discern on that uh, kind of information, but sometimes some issues may end up really coming to the top and other issues may not. So depending on what rises up, and, uh, and like I said, I mean, we really spend the time, uh, for instance, this year we had from over 200 friends, uh, churches and organizations from all over, all over the country, and they submitted their recommendations. So we sat down prayerfully and thoughtfully and reviewed all their recommendations and there are 13 members on the policy committee. And like you say, we have some lawyers, we have educators on there. And then we have folks with the different backgrounds, but um, our work is centered on listening and prayerfully thinking through what friends are asking the committee to discern on. So we met in and share and looked at the um, the information we had gathered from friends and prepared a draft that we shared with staff. And then in July, the policy committee met again and carefully and prayerfully weighed the June draft and also considered the input from our FCNL staff and created a second draft. We met again in August with the general uh, on a general committee call and uh, policy committee members sat in the meetings and listened um, to the feedback from general committee members. And again, in September, we met. And then we met again last week. So as you can see, it is a very lengthy process, but at the center of it, we really trust that friends are going to understand. And, and we've welcomed friends to participate in, uh, in the discernment process. So by the time we get to the final poly, uh, priorities that the staff is going to, to lobby on, we've really gone through quite an extensive uh, discernment and, and just being very prayerful and thoughtful through that whole process. I can't hear you, Diane. Thanks, Abby. I'm having a little difficulty today. Um, I participated in some meetings and I am impressed by how carefully uh, friends look at this. Um, and I wanna bring Amelia Keegan into the conversation now. 
Amelia, um, each of our standing committees has a staff person who is a liaison, and Amelia is the liaison to policy committee, so she is very familiar with the priorities, and I'm anxious to hear her talk a little bit about these priorities for the 117th Congress and what the prospects are as we look at January. But Amelia, before we turn to January, we have a lame duck session. And you are deeply invested in what's going to happen even in the next uh, four weeks before Congress recesses uh, at the end of the year. So can you say a word or two about what you're focused on? And then maybe we can talk about the priorities for the 117th Congress. Still, uh, you're muted still. Uh, you're having trouble unmuting. Okay, there you All go. Right, I'm good. Yes, thank you. All right, here we go. Um, uh, so thank you, Diane, for that, and and it's so great to to see all you and 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 to have seen so many of you at our annual meeting just a few days ago. And, and of course, I am uh, really delighted for the opportunity to talk about what we can do in this lame duck session, uh, because as Diane said, we have just a short window of time. So I, I do want to take just a quick a couple moments to talk about what we're really focused on in this uh, moment right now. And then, and then hopefully we can talk about a little bit where we see things going in 2021. But as you all know, you're reading the news, the virus is surging, and we know that there is enormous hardship across the country. Um, 11 million people are saying they don't know how they'll pay their rent, and we've got the CDC eviction moratorium that expires at the end of December. On December 26, 12 million people will wake up having lost their unemployment assistance because those provisions from the CARES Act will have expired. Um, the COVID paid leave uh, provisions will expire at the end of the year. We've got seven to 11 million children who are living in homes where the kids aren't getting enough to eat because their families can't afford it. So we can, as you, no, there is tremendous, tremendous need out there. And the next few weeks are so critical. Congress is gone next week for the Thanksgiving, uh, for the Thanksgiving recess. And then they come back for two. We think they'll end up making that three weeks to finish up for their work for their year. And we are saying for Congress, a COVID relief package is a must pass item. You have to pass that legislation in the lame duck session to address all the enormous need and hardship that is um, that is in our country. And we do have reason to hope. McConnell has said that he wants a COVID package passed in the lame duck session. Pelosi, Schumer, and Biden have met and uh, repeatedly called for a, a lame duck COVID package. And uh, even President Trump has said that he wants a package. So what we really need to do is really press Congress to A, get something done and really across the finish line, but also to make sure that that relief is really targeted to the things that we want. You know, additional nutrition assistance. This is the first time we've had a recession where Congress has not increased benefits nutrition assistance program or SNAP program. Um, you have needs for housing assistance to extend unemployment assistance for international humanitarian assistance. Um, so there are, we really believe that that there, a package needs to pass, but it also really needs to be focused and targeted. And so we're having a lot of meetings um, on Capitol Hill and whatever you all can do to reach out to your members of Congress um, would be in nor could be a real, real help in that, those efforts. Amelia, could you just share a little bit? I mean, you know, when we look at these legislative priorities, and I hope friends will look at the legislative priorities. I know Stephen has put them in the chat as well as the legislative ask on COVID. But the legislative priorities are bigger. I mean, they're kind of like uh, broad statements of what we're going to work on. How does, I mean, we didn't know when we set the priorities for 116th Congress that we would be lobbying now for a COVID relief package. And so how does this work to advocate for a COVID relief package fit with FCNL's priorities? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the the FCNL uh, legislative priorities really kind of 
I always say they, they are part of those we seeks, right? They fit in those we seeks of those ultimate goals of what we're trying to accomplish. And then what we do here at FCNL, the staff level is we kind of think about, okay, what are the specific policies? Where are there opportunities that we can be advancing on that legislation? And so looking at where are the opportunities within Congress, where does FCNL have a unique voice where we really provide value added to advancing these priorities. Um, and, and of course, um, we also kind of look to guidance as the specific policies of the broader kind of legislate our broader policy statement, which kind of is, is much bigger. So those, those three things, the policy statement, the legislative priorities of how we're gonna focus and put resources to say, yes, we're gonna cover this issue. And then thinking about, okay, what do we know about the opportunities in Congress and what, what are the specific legislative tactics that we're gonna take and policies we're gonna push to help advance that. Thanks very much. I want to remind friends that if you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat and we will try to get to questions before we close off at 4.30. Um, I know that um, sometimes people ask questions before that, that question about how you actually decide what to do when you have your legislative priorities is something that the policy committee also pays attention to, Abby. I mean, I know that you all, some of your discussions uh, were would look at what's possible, um, but also what's our values. And I think weighing those out is somewhere where we come uh, to these this list of priorities. And it's a lot. I mean, it's a, we work on a lot of big issues. Um, do you want to say something, Evie, about the overriding concern that we addressed uh, in this in this priority statement around addressing systemic racism and uh, sexism? Because it's something that the policy committee is certainly talked about and made a priority on in previous years, but it got more discussion this year. Um, thanks, Diane. Uh, that's very true. We decided to focus on uh, uh, issues uh, and uh, I, wanna, I want to call them, if, if, you, if you're looking at the priorities, you'll find that we have a statement in there that clearly articulates the fact that we are going to pay close attention to most of these issues to do with sexism, racism, and, uh, and uh, particularly when we are looking at each and every single one of our priorities, we will look at them from those lenses to try and see how our work uh, will be able to expose or eliminate uh, those, uh, um, those issues. And we do also recognize that uh, with the priorities, like you said earlier, Diane, there are very many of them. So it just ends up uh, ending up, it, it could end up being a question of what should be addressed and what should be left out. So we do recognize that the priorities are a commitment. And so we want to make sure that everybody understands that when we do have a lot of a lot of priorities, chances are with the limited staff and volunteer resources, uh, as well as the realities of Congress, because we don't know. And when we are setting up priorities, we don't know what Congress uh, is going to be in place at that time. So we look at those things. And in, in addition to adding new ones, uh, we have to be aware of some, that some priorities may end up uh, being removed, or at the same time, we also, if something comes up, uh, we we not we understand that the uh, staff are very ready to jump in and be able to uh, support or work on what is going on. But yes, I do agree with you, Diane. This year, we decided that we are going to pay very close attention, and we articulated that in our policies because that was a concern from previous years that we were, we are not paying attention to uh, particularly institutional racism and, and sexism, but that is something that FCNL has been working on. This is going to be my fourth year. And when I started, I've noticed that we are really making a concerted effort to highlight how we will pay attention to those issues as we do our work. Thanks, Abby. Um, 
Amelia, can I ask you to talk, I mean, certainly uh, just to say a, a word or two about, you know, our lobbying this week on the Justice and Policing Act is clearly directly related to the question of um, systemic racism in police systems. And so, you know, I know some people here lobbied, but I just to refresh for people that, you know, we, there is action that will be taken at the local level, but there's certainly federal action that can make a dramatic change. And so I know that that's an issue that we'll probably be looking to do a lot more on at, in January when, when Congress comes back. But Amelia, will you take just a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about what those uh, priorities are? You know them well for the 117th Congress. And what are the prospects? I mean, the fact is we're gonna have, uh, uh, we, we don't know for sure what the Senate you know, final composition will be. There's a still a runoff election in Georgia. So slim chance it could be a Democrat led Senate, but right now we assume it's probably gonna be a Republican Senate and a Democratic House. And so what do we think, what do we think can happen? Yeah, that's a great question, Diane. And, and one of the things when looking at the 117th Congress and looking at 2021, there are such huge challenges facing our country, right? And those are listed, articulated in those legislative pr priorities. And um, it feels like there's just been this, we've been building to this point where these are all, there are these, you could list a crisis for all of these issues, right? We're in the midst of a global pandemic, an economic recession. Uh, what has been happening with our immigration system and at our borders is a crisis. And um, what is our, the climate crisis, the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I mean, we can just go down the list of every single thing that we work on. And the, there is so much need to address all of these things in the next Congress. And the challenge is that Congress will not, probably not take comprehensive action on all of those things. And so our efforts are A, to see where is there possibility for some of those big legislative advancements and go all out to try and get that those things through. And that's going to take enormous bipartisan work because it's going to, we're really going to need some bipartisan efforts to get stuff through um, through Congress. And that's where FCNL really excels, where some of our partners don't. Um, the other thing is, is we are, you know, we look for those big opportunities to get big legislation through, but we also are very mindful of other vehicles and opportunities to maybe get pieces of some of the legislation that we're advancing through. Maybe it's on a spending bill, maybe it's on another uh, piece of legislation that's moving that we can attach some of our priorities to. So we're always conscious of like, wh what are the opportunities? How can we be strategic? But the final thing I'll say is, you know, we have been, we, we've been talking this whole year, I, I feel like we started the year 2020 knowing that this was an election year um, and knowing that we were going to be looking towards 2021 as an opportunity for change. So even in the midst of the pandemic and the recession and everything that's been going on, we have been laying the groundwork for 2021. Essentially, that's what we do, right? Because we're always pushing for systemic change. And the work that everyone did lobbying on Tuesday was laying the groundwork for police reform, right, for 2021. And so I, I think a lot of our work is really laying the groundwork so that we can be prepared for opportunities in 2021. Thank you, Amelia, that's great foundation. Um, I wanna ask you one question that we have in the chat and then Abby, I wanna come back to you and talk about the local meeting. But uh, the question in the chat, Amelia, is about healthcare and disparities in healthcare and, and what we might do about that given that the, um, the impact, I mean, we see this so prominently with COVID but we've seen it in other healthcare as well. So can you just speak to that briefly? And I know I'll just let people know that we are anticipating having um, a special session on healthcare and public health at the first of the year. So more to follow on that. But um, Amelia, please please give us a brief answer about that if you can. Well, sure. Well, yeah, certainly COVID has kind of shown a bright light on the health disparities in our country. And I think has hopefully kind of um, uh, sped up some of the desire to really tackle some of that or in, in, at least 
some of those conversations more to the forefront. Even before COVID, I did sense a, a growing interest in addressing health equity. And uh, in one of the, the coalition tables that we're a part of that works on health care, that has been a rising um, area of interest. Uh, among members of Congress. And so there's been, um, you know, increased talk of potential pieces of legislation to advance health. health. And certainly in uh, maternal, uh, maternal health, that is absolutely a, a area where we see huge health disparities and is, is an area that we would want to see addressed. That's, uh, I am not, my expertise does not run super deep in that area, but I, I have seen um, growing interest in that. And certainly we want to weigh in and lend our support in areas to address that when possible. And I think the other piece of that is, you know, that will come out is when we see a vaccine um, and you know who gets access to that. And uh, that is a, a huge question um, that we're gonna want to make sure that, um, uh, that some of those questions are addressing some of those equity issues. Thanks, Amelia. And thanks, Kathy, for your uh, note in the chat about federally qualified uh, community health centers. Um, I know from work I did before I came just to know how vital those if, if, uh, FQHCs, as they are known in um, the acronym parlance, are uh, to communities. And, and so thank you for your work in that area too. Um, we are almost out of time, but before we uh, close, um, I have a couple of things to say. I need to, I need to give some thanks, but Evie, I'd love to have you talk about the impact of these priorities on a local Quaker meeting. And you know, you're you're in the heartland there. Um, how do these, how do the priorities for um, nuclear disarmament or for economic justice or for um, justice and policing? How do those play in Ames, Iowa? And what do you, what do you all do about those? Yes, you're right. We are in the heartland and um, sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to just want to check out and say, I'm not going to be engaged because I'm in the heartland and probably most people I talk to may not agree with me politically, but really one thing I like about FCNL is we work with both sides of the aisle and it's been just wonderful. And uh, the most important thing is just to stay engaged all year round, stay engaged even if there is nothing particularly going on. And if you look at the priorities, there is always something going on all year round that really pertains to one of our priorities. So staying engaged all year round is important. Continuing to write letters to the elected officials and representatives is important. We visited the uh, offices in Des Moines, the, our, our senators, both senators, we had an opportunity to visit the offices in Des Moines and tell stories. Stories are very, very powerful. And I've realized that when we go in and tell stories, sometimes uh, on a return visit, the senators may remember a story that uh, someone uh, told. And then the other thing, I really, really like having those uh, one page, I call them one pages, flies on each of the priorities from FCNL because when you walk in, a lot of the staff in the Senate and, and congressional offices, some of them don't know and they have no idea what is going on in their own uh, constituencies or even their own communities. So having that and handing it out to them and saying, hey, this is what we have. Uh, you can look at that and, and ask questions. I've found uh, a lot of them are very receptive to that. So please just staying engaged all year round is very important. Abby, thank you. Those words are so true. That is exactly what we want people to do is to continue working with us. And that's what makes FCNL powerful. As, as you've heard before, it's having lobbyists like Amelia up on the hill and having constituents like Abby and all of you around the country willing to talk to your members of Congress. Um, Amelia, any final thoughts from you before we close out? Just really thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Um, I know that these past weeks and months and, and years have been, they've been challenging, right? And we're we're about to go into an, a new era and, and we're gonna need your help just as much. And so I just am so grateful for all that you you do as, as Abby and Diane say, the reason we have power on Capitol Hill is because of your work and because of all of you do. And anytime, 
your voice, I am on Capitol Hill all the time, even now virtually, your voice matters. I get to see the results of that. I can assure you, your voice makes a difference. Thank you so much, uh, both Amelia and Evie, for your words today and for your service uh, to FCNL in, in terms of uh, helping set these legislative priorities and, and guide the volunteers who, who work on this. Um, I want to say thank you to you all for your advocacy and, of course, thank you for your financial contributions to FCNL. Uh, we are able to feel the staff on Capitol Hill and, and engage people around the country because of your support. So thank you. In this season of gratitude, as we get ready to celebrate Thanksgiving, um, I, I just want to let you know how much you mean to us. Um, and I just uh, encourage you to uh, stay the course in terms of your patience with this virus and, and be safe. This is a, a somber time for all of us and uh, we want you healthy. We need you to continue working with us in this lame duck session and as we go forward next uh, year. Uh, I will say, so next week uh, we'll be having Thanksgiving two weeks from now. Um, I'm really happy that uh, Sister Simone Campbell, the head of Network, a Quaker, uh, excuse me, a Catholic lobby, who we work with very closely uh, will be my guest. And so we'll be talking about faith-based advocacy and uh, more about some of these issues of justice that Network has really led on um, and tell some stories about that. And then in four weeks, uh, Diana Olbaum, who is the legislative director for our foreign policy team and senior strategist will be joining me. And so we'll be talking more about the foreign policy work that we've done this year and what we're looking forward to in the coming year. So again, thank you friends for joining us. Uh, thank you, Evie, thank you, Amelia, and to all of you. And we look forward to seeing you um, in a couple of weeks.